Hello everyone, welcome back to the Aspire MDS NEET 2022 discussion. Today we will be discussing some of the image based questions in this video. But first of all, if you are new to the channel Aspire MDS videos, kindly subscribe it and press the bell icon so that whenever new videos of this series are coming, they would be notified to you. So let us start with the first question. The structure which is shown over here, post thyroidectomy, is what? The options were lateral lobe of thyroid gland, isthmus, pyramidal lobe of thyroid gland, or trachea. So we can clearly see that this is the trachea which has been shown and marked over here. So let us see some of the uh, data about thyroidectomy. So this thyroidectomy is basically a surgical removal of your thyroid gland. And as we know that thyroid gland, it is a butterfly shaped gland which is located at the base of your neck and it controls the uh, metabolism of your body and uh, now the thing is why this thyroidectomy is indicated it can be indicated in case of thyroid cancer or in case of non-cancerous enlargement of the thyroid uh, as such in goiter or due to overactoid, over, overactive thyroid that is in case of hyperthyroidism or indeterminate or suspicious thyroid nodules we can go for thyroidectomy surgery so basically when we see that it is a safe procedure only but there can be potential complications which includes bleeding post surgery or intra uh, operative during the surgery also also there can be post operative infection there can be low parathyroid hormones hormone levels also that is hypoparathyroidism which is caused by the surgical damage of parathyroid glands or there can be airway obstruction also even there can be a permanent hoarseness or voice or weak voice due to the nerve damage so these are the potential complications of thyroidectomy now uh, what we should keep in mind like there are several approaches for this thyroidectomy the approaches can be the conventional approach the conventional approach it uh, here it involves the incision which is given in the center of your neck to directly access the thyroid gland then another approach is trans oral approach here the incision is uh, avoided into the neck and the approach is directly through the mouth the third approach is endoscopic approach here smaller incisions are given in the neck and a small video camera is inserted through the incision and the camera guides the surgeon throughout the procedure so these are the various modes of thyroidectomy how it can be performed now this thyroidectomy can be a partial thyroidectomy when only a part of the thyroid is removed or it can be a complete thyroidectomy so this is all what you need to remember right now for thyroidectomy coming on to the next question the image over here depicts what diagnosis or there can be another form of question a patient comes with a pink discoloration of crown the radiograph is shown as such over here please confirm your diagnosis the options were internal root resorption external root resorption cervical root resorption or replacement resorption so first of all this image is given and the answer over here is internal resorption so let us study about this resorption patterns in detail so basically the resorption can be an internal resorption or an external resorption the destruction of teeth by this resorption they are due to the uh, cells which are located in the dental pulp so that would be an internal resorption or when it is due to the uh, damage in the pdl cells that can be an external resorption so let us talk about the internal resorption it is usually asymptomatic and discovered through routine radiographs but this internal resorption it exhibits two patterns that can be an inflammatory resorption or the replacement or metaplastic resorption now talking about this inflammatory resorption which is also called as the pink tooth of memory which is shown over here in the question now this inflammatory resorption it usually affects the cervical part or the cervical zone of the root canal and the area of destruction usually appears as a uniform well circumscribed symmetric radiolucent enlargement of the pulp chamber or canal okay 
Now, when it is seen in the coronal pulp or clinically, when we see it can be seen as a pink discoloration, which is also called as pink tooth of mummery because of the vascular resorption that occurs on the surface. Now, talking about the another type of internal resorption that is replacement or the metaplastic resorption. Here, the pulpal or the dentinal walls are resorbed and replaced with the bone or cementum like bone. Radiography, radiographically, when we see, it appears as an enlargement of the canal, which is filled with a material that is less radio denser than the surrounding dentin. And the radiographic appearance often demonstrates partial obliteration of the canal in this kind of resorption. Now, let me talk about the external resorption. If it is asked in exam, it is generally seen as a moth eaten appearance of the tooth structure or an aggressive resorption which can be seen like which has been seen over, shown over here here the radiolucency is also there which is less well defined and we can see a variation in the density of the uh, tooth so this is the external root resorption or external resorption of the tooth coming on to the next question the instrument which is shown over here they are Hayton Williams forceps Roes forceps, Walsham forceps, or H forceps. So here the answer is Roes forceps. See this Roes forceps, they are the maxillary forceps which are used for uh, maxillary disinfection in case of leafwood fractures. They are always coming in pair because it is to be used for right and left maxilla. So they are a pair of right and left forceps. So we'll see we'll see about different type of forceps over here. This uh, this is the Roes forceps. Now, how it is used? The lesser wing of this forceps, or the what we can say, flatter, flatter surface, or the flatter wing, is inserted into the nasal cavity, whereas the curved end. It goes into the mouth and holds the maxilla from within or the palatal part. Okay, so that is your rose forcep. And here we can see another uh, forcep which is used for maxillary disinfection that is Hayton Williams forceps. But here, when you see the beak over here is larger and the shape is symmetrical, both the uh, what we can say the blades they are of same uh, shape. Now, when we talk about different types of forceps for nasal fracture or nasal uh, bone reduction forceps, they can be Walsham forceps or H forceps. So, these are both the forceps which are shown over here. These both are used for nasal bone reduction after the fracture. So, these both are used for the closed reduction. Here you can see in the Walsham forceps, the beak is going in a, uh, it is shorter. Whereas in case of H forceps, it is a longer beak which we can see. So this is about the various types of forceps which are used. Coming on to the next question, the marked space, the marked dark space which is given in the smiling patient is termed as the options are black triangles, the buccal corridor space, outer commissural space, or Nisvanger space. So the question over here is asking about this this box or this space over here okay so uh, this the answer over here is it is called as the buccal corridor space now let us understand what is this buccal corridor space it is a neg negative or a dark space which, which is visible during the smile formation between the corners of the mouth and the buccal surface of the maxillary teeth now how it is measured it is measured from the mesial line angle of the maxillary first molar or premolar that is first premolar to the interior portion of the commissure of the lips so this is very important why this buccal corridor space is important because it decides the attractiveness of the smile suppose the buccal corridor if it is less then it would be very much unattractive but if it is very much more then also it would be unattractive so it should neither be completely eliminated neither it should be kept maximum so the buccal corridor space is to be maintained it and it is kept in mind while doing the orthodontic treatments and if the 
buccal cordial space is more, it can be uh, lessened by expansion of the maxillary arch. Hence, this is the answer. Coming on to the next question. A patient came with a given condition in maxillary lateral incisor. What is your diagnosis? The options over here are torodontism, dense evaginatus, dense invaginatus, and talons cusp. Now, here we have to see correlate both the clinical as well as the radiographic findings. So, here we can see a part which is shown over here. And here in the radiograph also we can see that there is a structure which is seen just like a tooth within a tooth. So, the answer very obvious is dense invaginatus that is dense in dente. Now, first let's, let's understand what is dense evaginatus. It is an uncommon developmental anomaly which we can see which is characterized by a presence of tubercle on the occlusal surface of the mandibular premolars and lingual surface of the anterior teeth. Now, what about dense invaginatus? Now, this dense invaginatus, it is a malformation in the teeth which is resulting due to abnormal infolding of the dental papilla during the tooth development. Now, here the affected teeth would be showing a deep infolding of the enamel and the dentin which starts from the foramen cecum or even at the tip of the cusps which may extend deep into the root. Now, this was the simple question which was asked. Now, we have to go into a detail of that. So, we'll see the types of dense invaginators which was given by Ovalers in 1957. So, there are basically three types of classification and there is an extended version of three, the type 3 that is type 3B. So, when we see type 1 over here, the invagination which is confined within the crown, here it is only confined to the crown and does not extend beyond the level of amylo cemental junction. Whereas, in case of type 2, we can see that the invagination extends into the pulp chamber but remains within the root canal with no communication with the periodontal ligament. When we talk about the type 3, here the invagination extends through the root and communicates laterally with the PDL through the pseudo foramen over here. And when we see type 3B, here the invagination extends to the root and communicates with the periodontal ligament at the apical foramen. So these are the various types of dense invaginators and that's all for today's video. Thank you.